Right. So I think I'm going to try it without the mic. Can you hear me in the back? I'd like to talk about um, some work that I've been doing for the last 10 years or so together with my wife, Corinne Minot, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, I'm not going to tell you much about the Actonians because we don't have much time, but there are four division algebras. They have multiplication tables. <laughs> And what I'd like to show you, this was already the short version. What I'd like to show you, my starting point, is that if you take, in fact, any of these division algebras, but think about four-dimensional space-time, a space, a four-vector. There's a nice way to rewrite that as a Hermitian two-by-two two matrix. And if you do that, lots of things become very interesting. In particular, the algebraic structure, the determinant, is suddenly the Lorentzian inner product. And so there's a very, there's something natural going on here. The first point I want to make is you have four division algebras. You can do this in four cases. You're making a Hermitian matrix so the diagonal is real. And then you're putting a division algebra element on the, on the off diagonal. You put one, two, four, or eight things in there and two more. You get out three, four, six, or ten space-time dimensions. <coughs> Those are the dimensions in which classical supersymmetry works. This is the reason classical symmetry works in those four dimensions, although that's not the way it was originally figured out. Um, so there's something very interesting going on here with the division algebras. That's point one. Um, skip that. The next step is to look at two component spinners in this language. So the vectors now are matrices, so the spinners are, well, column vectors. And write down in momentum space the massless Dirac equation, the Weyl equation, which is just in momentum space an eigenvalue equation. And you can start asking about solving that equation. And it's, again, it's just an eigenvalue equation. It's a simple linear algebra. But the remarkable thing is if you do this over the Actonians, you only get out quaternionic solutions. That's point number two. Something very interesting happens over the Actonians. You don't actually get out as many solutions as you thought you would. But I'm not so interested in massless objects. I'd like to talk about massive objects, so I need the Dirac equation. The Dirac equation is four component spinners. Four component spinners, well, are just two component quaternionic things. And so the next thing I'm going to do is to go up a dimension in order to be able to continue to talk about massless objects although I'm really describing massive objects in lower dimensions. This is something we call dimensional reduction. If you start with one of these bigger division algebras, say the Octonians, there's a natural projection down to the complexes, which has the effect of treating mass as pointing in some other direction. And if you think about um, call, uh, null vectors in higher dimensions and you project them down into lower dimensions, you get both null vectors, massless objects, and massive timeline vectors, massive objects. And so this is a unification, if you'd like, of looking at both massive and massless objects together. All right, we're almost there. Um, skip that. Angular momentum in this language, I want to identify the solutions of the Dirac equation that I've got. I haven't done anything new. I've just translated the Dirac equation into a funny new language. So I'll translate the standard notion of spin, of angular momentum, into this new language. And the first thing I have to tell you is that self-adjoint operators over the Octonians admit non-real eigenvalues. And in particular, here's a simultaneous eigenstate of all three angular momentum operators. The catch is that only one of the eigenvalues is real. And from this point of view, the failure, the, I'm sorry, the inability of being a, the inability to measure all three components of angular momentum or spin at the same time comes from the fact that the eigenvalues fail to commute. So here's the game you would play in a quantum field theory course. You've solved the Dirac equation. You've written your four component Dirac spinners, except I've repackaged them in terms of two component Penrose spinners that are quaternionic, no problem. But so I can identify which things are, say, a spin up electron or a spin down electron. I should really say spin up uh, mass, massive object or um, uh, massless objects, which I'll call neutrinos. And here is the sort of mass direction sitting in there somehow, and that's fine. And the question is, I'm over the Octonians, how many times can I do this? Well, I have lots of quaternionic subalgebras in the Octonians. 
I'll impose a couple of conditions, label them by I, J, and K. In the end, there's exactly three of these seven wonders of the universe we had just before. I'm hoping I can at least offer a glimpse of explanation for some of these. This framework leads naturally to three copies of the standard solutions of the Dirac equation, which I'll go out on a limb and call three generations. Okay. Three objects that look like electrons, put I's, J's, or K's in there. Three objects that look like left-handed neutrinos, put I's, J's, or K's in there. And one non-generational right-handed neutrino. Sterile neutrino, again, this is a toy model. I'm speculating. I don't know. So that's great. That was the warm-up. Now what do I do? Well, I'd like quarks. I claim I have a hint of three generations of leptons. I claim I have a hint of single eliciting neutrinos. But I'd really like interactions. We have no interactions here. Don't call this a physical theory yet. This is a toy model. I'm calling things electrons and neutrinos, but I really don't know that. I'd like to talk about SU3, quarks, and charge. How do we do that? Well, there's a natural way to do that. Go from two by two objects to three by three, three component objects. There's a natural interpretation of the exceptional groups F4 and E6 as rotation groups, matrix groups, unitary or general linear groups in over the octonians. Um, and the nice thing is, as has been known for many years, E6 has both U1 cross SU2 cross SU3 sitting inside it, as well as the Lorentz group. It seems to be the right size. I'm almost done. One of my students recently has looked at E6. Here's a map of E6. Okay. Here's a map of E6 from the point of view of division algebras. These are real representations, real forms of some of the subalgebras, but labeled with which division algebra they go with and how to put them together. So that's a piece of the puzzle. We don't know all the details yet, but we have, that's a piece of it. Um, and the language that I would claim is the one one needs to use is to go to this 3 by 3 formalism, which has, well, that's really a momentum to you know, a four-component vector sitting in there and a spinner. There's a sort of a supersymmetry in the sense of bosons and fermions sitting in a single object here. The Cayley plane is the object of things that, well, solve the Dirac equation in this language. This turns out to be the Dirac equation. The things that solve them are quaternionic again. Um, what have I got? I have an algebraic description that looks like it has the right size when I solve the Dirac equation. This is just a translation of what you've already seen. I wind up with decompositions of Hermitian matrices that have one, two, or three pieces. Maybe, just maybe, quarks without quarks. I have done my punchline. I love this part. Life is complex. It has real imaginary parts. <laughs> maybe a couple of guys. Thank you. So, with a very loose definition of particle, yes. The, the, so, I can do it for um, electrons and neutrinos, as I showed you at the beginning. I don't have a clear understanding of where the quarks sit in the three component formalism, but it does appear to be the right size. Okay, so we're still looking for a better identification, but I would say yes, again, particle means formal solution of the Dirac equation in momentum space where I have no interactions. So in that sense, it's just a toy model. Okay, one more. One. And you have only one right head neutrino. Correct. And it does not belong to any generation. And there's no way to get more. Correct. Okay, one more question. The octonians are not associated. Correct. So there's an algebraic structure with no group? It's uh, yes, and there are ways of thinking. I mean, what you saw was descriptions of groups as though you can describe groups with octonians, even though the octonians themselves are not associative. Um, but yes, they're alternative. They're almost associative. You can still do almost everything you want. You got to be careful. Thank you again.